Hi, my name is Justin, and I'm the executive pastor of Family Life here at GCC. And I just want to let you know that we believe this is your time. This is your time to worship. It's your time to serve. It's your time to grow. And I want to take just a moment to let you know what your next steps are. At the end of every service, we do something called Gen and Five. It's where we take just five minutes to talk about who we are as a church. We also have something called Connect Class, where we go in depth and we talk about the DNAs and the values of who we are. If you want to serve, we have something called Behind the Scenes Tour, where you can do just that. You can go behind the scenes of who we are as a church and find out where your spot is. And finally, we would love to connect with you as you connect with Christ at our Next Steps area. So no matter where you're at, we cannot wait to see you. I think they would have kept going if we hadn't started the music. I don't know. I think they just would have kept going. Uh, man, welcome to church. I don't, we, we've got the kids back in school. I'm so excited. They're going to bed early. It's like, it's six o'clock, guys. Tomorrow's a school day. <laughs> Taking it serious. <laughs> it's, it's been great. You know, we're, we're doing this We're doing this new series called Living It. Fear of, like, we start like about three weeks. This week, we've looked for some pictures for every week. And I've got this one because this looks like a, a couple that's like, our kids are in school. Right? Didn't they just say that? They're so excited about education. Uh, getting them kids going at it. Uh, you know, I, I've told the boys, Jen and I, we kind of experienced about three weeks, you know, where uh, we, we, I, I wasn't preaching and we were doing family devos. And I told the kids, man, I'm excited for this weekend. I get, a, I get a come back and we're preaching. And the boys like, dad, you preach every day. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't think I like their tone when they said that. Uh, but I am. We, we're doing this living it series because we're all, we're all living something. Right, you know, you ask people all the time, "How you doing? Living the dream, man." Everyone that says that, I, I'm skeptical. I don't know. If you answer really quick, "Living the dream," is like, ah, I think it's a nightmare. You I'm living on a prayer usually. Um, every word of that song, I know it. Uh, and so I, I, I get that, but we're all living something, right? And this is why when Jesus shows up, he's not disconnected from the human experience. And Jesus isn't, he's fully God and fully man. So when he engages us, he engages us with the thing that we're doing, life and living life. It's one of the largest themes in Christ's ministry. He talks to people about the things that they are living. He's like, how are you living? And he says, I've come to help you with that. It's a big theme. So we're not pulling this theme out of thin air. It comes from the ministry of Jesus because there are things we are to be living. The gospel, faith, love. These are things really, and I want to show you with Jesus's own words, how much of a theme this is in his teaching. John 10.10, 10, he's speaking about the enemy. And he says, he calls the enemy here the thief. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Uh, abundance is what some translations say. I, I'm here for you to live it in, in a bigger, better way than what you're currently doing. This is what Jesus comes offering. He says at another time, he's speaking to a lady in John 11:25, 25, and he says this to her. I'm this. I'm the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me lives. And even though they die, they live. And then he says in verse 26, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. So this theme of living it, it's central to who Jesus is. And there's some specific things that we're called to live. This week, we're going to look at our core verse, which is Mark 1, 1. One short verse that begins Mark's testimony account of Christ's life. It says this, the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah the son of God. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the son of God. Gospel good news, kind of interchangeable words. And so this week we're talking about living it, the gospel, living the gospel. And before I dive into what that verse really has for us, and it has a lot, you got to know some things about Mark. See, Mark, although he does have one of the eyewitness accounts in the New Testament, he's the second book of the New Testament, uh, he He's not one of the 12 apostles. 
but he grew up really close to the epicenter of Christ's ministry. When Christ was in Jerusalem, uh, his mother, a, a widow, owned a house there. We believe it's a large house from a lot of the other clues throughout the New Testament. And he's around Peter lots. Matter of fact, Peter even calls Mark a spiritual son in, in, in one of his letters. And Peter takes Mark out of the city of Jerusalem that he's grown up in, and he travels with Mark and lives in Rome. It's there that this gospel account of the, of the life of Christ is written by Mark. We believe, a lot of scholars believe that it's written it's kind of towards the end of Peter's life, Peter dies and then Mark finishes it. He, he even goes on the first missionary journey with Paul and Mark writes his gospel account in really kind of a Roman mindset. The Roman mind is action Oriented. They are get it done kind of people, all right? And so over 40 times in Mark's gospel, he uses the, the Greek word for immediately. This happens right away. If you look at Matthew, Luke, and John, you will see a lot of red letters. These are important for us because we hear Jesus saying in his own words who he is and what his, what his intentions are with us. And he tells us himself who he is. But in Mark's gospel, there's, there's a lot of like Jesus did this and then this happened. And he is showing all of us through the action of what Christ is. Now, the house that he grows up in Jerusalem, Jerusalem can be a bustling city. Up to 350,000, 400,000 people when all of the Jews come back for the big ceremonies. Whenever the Jews are getting their festival on, everyone comes back to Jerusalem and the city kind of balloons and then goes down in size. And the house that he grows up in is really kind of a, an important house to the early Christians. Matter of fact, when Peter, when Simon Peter escapes from prison miraculously in Acts chapter 12. He goes looking where the Christians are going to be hanging out to let them know, I'm out, I'm out of jail, this crazy thing happened. He goes to Mark's house because they gather there all of the time. There's a, a famous historian, Sir William Mitchell Ramsey. He was educated in a school of thought that denied the historical reliability of the New Testament. His college that he went to said, the Bible's a good book, but we can't really rely on the accuracy of the New Testament. He graduated from that school and began his work in antiquities and archaeological studies and digs throughout Asia Minor and the Palestinian territory. And through studying history and that work, he became convinced about the historical accuracy of the New Testament and became a leading authority on Asia Minor and a New Testament scholar. It's Sir William Mitchell Ramsey that actually tells us he believes that the upper room where Christ Jesus gave us communion, the meal that we just celebrated together, was actually in Mark's house. Mark was around. Mark was seeing the apostles and seeing Christ come into the city and saw who Jesus was. He comes from a small town and in the city of Rome, he writes the very first book ever written, and the very first time the word gospel is ever written, Mark pens it. He tells us through this one verse what living the gospel really is. Living the gospel is living boldly, living Jesus, and living the word. Again, I would read to you Mark 1.1. 1, 1. And let's dig into this. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Maybe if you probably know that uh, we're doing 52 key verses this year as we walk through God's word. And you might say, I, it's all, all God's word's good, but maybe you wouldn't choose this one verse to be one of the top 52. I would, I would challenge you that there's more to this verse than what meets the eye when we think about who Mark is and what Mark is actually writing. See, sometimes we have to take off uh, all of the connotations we put on things. When you hear terms like the beginning of the good news or the beginning of the gospel, those are kind of churchy words. Good news, brother, have you heard the good news? You know, I heard that growing up all the time, you know. And it, it, maybe you put things on that, like, oh, that's a church term. It was not a church term when Mark first wrote it. The word that Mark actually wrote here was living the gospel in boldness. Mark was living the gospel and living the gospel is living boldness because what he wrote was a political term. The word he wrote was inangalehu. 
you can even hear the word evangelist in there. Inangalehu. That is the beginning of the Inangalehu about Jesus. The first time that Inangalehu was ever associated with who Jesus was because the word Inangalehu was a word used by the cult of emperors. For Rome, their generals won a lot for a long time. That's why they had an empire. They would go off, whoop up on somebody somewhere, and then they would come back and they would tell the Anangalehu. It means glad tidings. They did not have cable network news to tell of their great exploits. And so as they go off to war and they come back and they're ready to sit in the seat of government and rule over the empire, they would spread the Anangulehu about all of the good things that they are doing for the kingdom. So they would send a rider out and the rider would come into the town square. Anangalehu, glad tidings, information and news about our emperor. Our emperor is doing Anangalehu for you. It's, it's a festival for you in honor of the emperor. Anangalehu, glad tidings, good news. The, the king, the emperor has won another battle in a far distant place and you don't matter, but we're richer. Good for you, right? And all of this kind of centered around the things that the emperor had done for himself. We actually have found this inscription in Perine, Turkey. There's uh, lots of ruins there. One is uh, the temple of Athena, a, a Greek god. There's a Roman inscription that's been found there with this Anangalehu on it. Uh, just an example. It was about Augustus the emperor. He said, Anangalehu, glad tidings, we are now going to have a brand new way of doing the calendar, and we're going to start the first day of the year with my birthday. Congratulations. Good news for you, right? <laughs> this, this, was, this was the term that, that was used. It was good news as plural, always plural, because there's always good things that the emperor is doing. And even on their money. On their money, they would talk about things like this. Here's a picture of a Roman coin. This is Caesar Augustus Tiberius's kind of face on this coin. And the inscription is Caesar Augustus Tiberius, son of the divine Augustus. Divine, God. This is your emperor who's the son of a god. What Mark does when Mark 1-1, it really isn't even a full sentence, Many believe that this is just the title to his account of what Jesus did. And he starts in boldness, unashamed, almost a dangerous political statement. He says this, you want real good news? He uses the singular. There is only one good news, and it is about Jesus. And he is truly the son of a living God. It's a big statement. It calls to mind what Paul would write to the church in Rome a few years later. In verse 16 of the very first chapter, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone that believes. There is power in the gospel. And Mark wasn't afraid to start his account maybe even as he walked the very marble, pristine, beautiful seats there in Roma, saying, you want to know what real Anangalehu is? All other news in life compared to this is just okay news. This is really good news. And it's one news. It's a man who's Jesus. And he is the son of God. So if living the gospel is living boldness, how do we do that? How does that translate for us? Living the gospel boldly is living the gospel like Jesus. Living the gospel is, in fact, living Jesus. Another translation of Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the English Standard Version, actually exchanges that word in Angalehu. It says this, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. See, it is not just about him. It is, in fact, him. When the emperor sends a writer out to etch something into stone or to gather the townspeople and give them an Angalehu, he rides out on his horse, gathers everyone, and is like, hear ye, hear ye, in Angalehu, let me read this. And he reads the good news. That messenger is not the good news. That good news is not about the messenger. In this case, Jesus embodies and is the gospel. 
Living the gospel is living Jesus. The gospel that Jesus proclaims and brings is in fact him in the flesh, a person. But what if you and I have a distorted view of who Jesus really is? See, Jesus was born and he lived a very real life. There's a, there's a perfect, accurate, accurate vision of who Christ is. But on this earth at this time, Jesus has allowed until his second coming for the thief, as we read, the evil one, the devil, to have some control on this earth. And we know that because we see his hand at work. And one of the things that the enemy wants to do is to distort our accurate view of who Jesus is. So there is a chance that both myself at times and you, that we have a, a view of who Jesus is and our perspective is off. And so when we are trying to live the gospel, live Jesus, we're actually living a distorted view of who Jesus is. Cultures have tried to have an image of Christ since the beginning of time. Maybe you've got a view of Christ and he is wrapped in your national flag. Maybe, maybe you view Jesus and Jesus has got you know, a born in the USA t-shirt on. I mean, maybe this time of year, if you're like me, you think Jesus has got like a Denver Bronco jersey on. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where you're coming from. But cultures all time, if they've done this, here's a, here's a picture of Jesus uh, as depicted in, in an Asian culture. Here's a, another picture that maybe you've seen, a famous uh, mosaic of Jesus as a grown man. And we've been trying to see what he's like and have a vision of the real Jesus so we can live him for all of, for 2,000 years. Here's Jesus as a child. We're coming, you might not realize it yet, but Christmas is here right now. It is. It's, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm holding off the decorations and with all I have, and I think I've got 15 days left in me, okay? Because once we pass, you know, Hallmark in July, it's on like Donkey Kong, okay? It's, it's all I can do to keep that stuff put up. And so this is the time of year that people picture Jesus as a baby. And they're like, oh, don't make baby Jesus mad. That's the wrong, Jesus was a baby at one time, but he's all grown up now, okay? Here's, here's a picture of Jesus giving uh, the very first ever fantasy football advice, I think. He's trying to give a pick on a first round pick there. I don't know, maybe not, looks like it to me. This week, our family was trying to uh, find something to watch on Netflix. I don't know what that goes like for you. For us, we look for something to watch on Netflix for about an hour and 15 minutes. <laughs> Lively conversation. <laughs> And then we watch something finally for 15 minutes and we all fall asleep. That's, that's, that's what really watching Netflix is uh, it's all about. And uh, I, I saw there's a, there's a brand new series that launched here in the, about the last eight or nine days. It's called The Family. And when I, when I saw the, one of the playbills for the family, there was a clear picture of Jesus, uh, you know, like this old Renaissance picture of Jesus, oil painting. And uh, I saw in the description that there was something about Jesus in it. And so I said, I'm, I'm going to watch that. And I, I've watched a couple of episodes. And I, I want to I let you know that, as I warned you, that there is an enemy that is trying in this world to create a picture of Jesus for you to deny because he wants you to deny Jesus. And there are things I saw in this documentary series and, and depictions, perceptions of Christ that I shuddered at, that I said, that is not the Jesus that I've witnessed in my life or in, in the word of God. And then there are some other pictures of Jesus in that documentary series and perceptions of Christ that I'm like, that is who he is. We've got to be able to know who Jesus is if we are going to live the gospel and live Jesus. If living the gospel is living Jesus, we've got to have an accurate view. I believe that his own words and the eyewitness accounts of how he treated people and his attitudes towards people and his actions in people's lives speak to the clearest identity of the person of Jesus Christ. Do you know him? I'd like to take a moment just to view a few of the things that Jesus did Jesus treated his mother with respect and made wine. Jesus healed an enemy Gentile soldier's son just because the father asked. Jesus healed a man terrorizing a town who was demon-possessed in Mark 1, verse 23 through 28. He gave that man's life, family, and future back to him. 
Jesus had compassion on Peter's mother-in-law and healed her in her sickness. Jesus healed a man with leprosy. Jesus healed a centurion servant who is paralyzed and suffering terribly in Matthew 8, 5. Jesus raised a widow's son from the dead in Luke 7, 11. It was the only man she had left in her life to care for her. He healed two men that were so demon-possessed that they shut a road down in a town in Matthew 8, 28. Jesus cured a woman who had been bleeding for 12 years and reached out to him and just touched his robe. Jesus healed two blind men who cried out, have mercy on us, son of David. Jesus healed a man who was demon-possessed and could not talk. Jesus healed a man who could not walk and sat paralyzed by a pool for 38 long years. Jesus restored a withered hand in Matthew 12, 10. Jesus met with Nicodemus at night. He took him and gently taught him that he must be baptized and born again of water baptism. He must believe in Jesus as the son of God. Jesus met with a man in his house who was a swindler in business. And everyone in town hated him. His name was Zacchaeus. Jesus met with a person who wanted to be alone. And he told her about her past and changed her future and the entire town's future from where she came from, the woman at the well. Jesus showed compassion to a woman who was caught in sexual sin and everyone who was ready to throw stones. And Jesus de-escalated the situation and showed tenderness and kindness to someone who was vulnerable. Jesus cured 10 lepers, even though two were going to come back and say thanks. Jesus comforted Lazarus' sisters when they mourned the death of their brother. He wept at the human condition of death. And then Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Jesus wept for the people of Jerusalem. He said, oh, if I could just gather you up and hold you in my arms. Jesus fed 5,000 people one time and 4,000 people at another time. Jesus said this about kids, let them come to me. Jesus humbled himself to wash the feet of his friends. Jesus healed the ear of a man who came to kill him. Jesus said, treat people with impartiality. Do not treat a rich person better than you would a poor person. Don't treat someone who has a prestigious place in your community better than you would treat someone who is a foreigner in your community. Love everybody always. That's how Jesus said to treat people. Jesus taught that there is a real judgment day that is coming. Jesus taught time and time again in the book of Matthew, in his own words, that hell is a real place and many would go there. And he was not happy about that. He actually said, I wish that none would perish and all would come to the Father through a relationship with me. Those are his words about hell. Jesus stood up against the false teachers and religious leaders of the day that used God's house for their own selfish gain. Jesus stopped a man named Saul from killing Christians and forgave him and then turned his name to Paul and let Paul join with him in the work of the church for the rest of his life. And Jesus was submissive and kind to the governing authorities as they carried out and washed their hands of his execution. Jesus took a moment in his death to comfort another who was a thief who deserved to die next to him. Jesus took care of his mother while on the cross. Jesus asked his father to forgive the very people who were killing him while they were killing him in the last moments of his life. Jesus died for everyone. Jesus loves everyone. Jesus rose from the grave and appeared to over 500 people who would testify, not because they would get money, not because it was popular at that day and time to do so. Many would give their lives on their eyewitness account that Jesus in Christ rose from the dead. Over 500 people proving that he, in fact, is the son of God. Jesus forgave Peter for running away and abandoning him and then lying three times saying he didn't even know his best friend. And Jesus said, I forgive you, Peter. And he let Peter come back and work in the kingdom until his death. 
Jesus was patient when Thomas said, I'm not going to believe until I see it myself. And Jesus showed up in the room and said, Thomas, it's true. Feel my hands. Feel the scar in my side where they put a sword. Jesus was recorded and witness to being loving to every person he contacted. Jesus initiated contact. Jesus wasn't too busy for anyone. Jesus was intentional to show beyond a shadow of a doubt that he loved and still loves you. Do you have an accurate eyewitness view of who Jesus, the person, really is and what his intentions are in your life? Living the gospel is living Jesus. And we can't live boldly if we don't live like Jesus. We know that Jesus actually is the word of God. And so living the gospel is living the word. I'd like to tell you about a, a young lady named Willadine. Here's a, here's a picture of her. She looks like a, just, a, just a kid. They were kids when they got married. Um, one of my favorite stories of Willadine is uh, she worked at the Mars Chocolate Bar Factory in Chicago, Illinois during World War II. Incredible life. She married her sweetheart, Paul, and they went to, they went to Bible college together. And God placed on their heart just a love for the good news. Mark 1.1. 1, 1. Evangelae. Evangelio. Real good news. And they moved to their small family to Denver, Colorado and started a Spanish-speaking church that proclaims the gospel even today in Spanish to people in the Denver area. She lived a long life. She actually went to Bible college with my grandfather. This is my wife's grandmother. She lost a son over 50 years ago, Manford. She's not seen him in 50 years. She lost a husband over 20 years ago. Just imagine being in your 90s and all of the joys of life and all of the hardship of life. And today, Willa Dean, she has a hard time remembering what happened yesterday. Short-term memory is difficult. She has a hard time knowing what she had for breakfast. Many times when my father-in-law, Terry, and Karen go to visit. They have to remind her uh, the names of all the grandkids. And if, if we call, we've got to tell her, tell them what kid we belong to. And we're, we're Terry's kids. But when mom and dad visit, it does not take long for the word of God to be at the, the top of the conversation. Dad tells us that what he'll do is he will start a verse of scripture like Hebrews 4.12 that says this about the word of God. Dad will say, for the word of God is living. And though she can't remember breakfast, Willadine will say, the word of God is living and active and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's piercing to the division of the soul, the spirit of joints and marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That's what the word of God is. Living the gospel is living the word. And if we're going to live boldly and we're going to live Jesus, we've got to have an accurate description, which means we've got to know the word. Well, the dean's seen a lot of joy, a lot of sorrow. I think what has carried her through is living Jesus, living the word. I've seen her live boldly. I've seen dad's Facebook page of four pages laid out across the carpet of things that she's praying for, front and back. Mark, chapter one, verse one, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the Inagolehu. And Mark defiantly says, in that great Roman empire, in that big city, the empire that will never vanish from the face of the earth, he's got the boldness to step out there and say, you wanna know what real good news is? Jesus Christ is the only good news. And he alone is the son of God. He alone is the way to God. That's boldness. Here's what's great. If you have never heard Evangelehu, good news, but you're hearing these things about Jesus and 
the spirit of the living God, which is active in this room right now, is telling you in the depths of who you are, this stuff is true. And it doesn't matter what your past is. The perfectness of Jesus can be put on you through saying, Mark 1, 1, that I believe that Jesus is the good news and I believe that he is the son of God and I accept him as my savior. He will not force it on you. But he's described as standing at the door of your heart and knocking. He's there and he wants to come and live inside you. He wants you to live this life with him. Live the gospel. We have to make that decision to let him in. He's eager. He's waiting Patiently, He's pursuing a relationship with you. You are not guaranteed a moment past this one. If you've not made that decision to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, Jesus stands at the, the door of your heart and knocks. And all you have to do is say, I believe these things. And begin a life of obedience, starting with baptism. And let the Spirit of God live in you. That's what we call being a Christian. It's not being perfect. It's having someone who's perfect cover your life with their perfectness. He wants that for you. Maybe you had other plans this fall of how you were going to live your fall. Maybe you've made that decision before. You consider yourself a professed believer, but the truth is, is there might be some distractions in your life and they might even be good things, but they've taken precedent. And what you're really living for right now is not boldness in the gospel and Jesus and his word, but other agendas you've put in front of that. And Jesus is telling you right now, we've got to refocus this fall. This fall's not going to go the way you want if you live it according to the plan that you've got in front of you. Our team's going to come and they're going to sing this song. It's an older song and I love the words of this song because it simply says this, you're enough. Jesus is enough. He's more than you've ever thirsted for. He's all that you'll ever need. It's more than enough for everything that you're going through. And I imagine that many of you, many of us today are going through some things in life. So I'm going to invite our prayer team. We're, we're a praying church here. It's what we believe in. To, uh, to come and join us down front here. And so I want to invite everyone in this room, if you would stand right now. As our prayer team comes down uh, front, we want to invite you, if you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, don't miss this opportunity as they sing. I'm going to be down here with my wife and some other folks. If you come down, we want to pray with you and talk with you. If you just need someone to pray with you and you just say, I just need Jesus right now to, to come into my life and be enough right now in the trial I'm going through, we want to be praying with you. So if you want to respond, we would love that. And we're going to sing about how Jesus is enough. Let's sing, y'all.